I have good news. I have seen the copy of Garrett's devotional, the lyrics for his life, the Lenten guide that you'll be receiving next Sunday, just so you know. I know many of you are eager, but we will have those to pass out to you next Sunday, and it should be a glorious time during Lent together. Well, speaking of glorious time, here we are. Isn't it good just to sing together? I can't tell you just in preparation before I even pray, like, it's so good for my heart to know what I'm getting ready to preach to you. I hope you hear the Lord as he speaks to you through his word. I watch as some of you walk in and newlyweds with all the life ahead of you with joy, and it's like, Lord, there's so much to rejoice over. And I know some of you are just struggling. I know some of you, it was just really hard to make it here today. The reality is, for those who are in a season of joy and newness, for those in a season of mourning and hurt, our passage today is a beautiful, encouraging passage, and I hope you feel the Lord's love. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you have given us your righteousness, and you have drawn us in, and you've allowed us to call you Father. So Lord, as we listen to your words being preached today, we realize we have things in our heart that we need you to touch. We need you to intervene. We thank you for the armor that you've given us. Lord, we pray that we would put it on well. We thank you for what you've done already on our behalf. Holy Spirit, would you do your work? Would you illuminate our, our minds and our hearts to receive what you want to speak to us today? In Jesus' name, amen. Our passage today comes from Ephesians chapter 6. If you'd like to read along with me, I'm reading verses 10 to verse 20. Paul says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, um, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth to boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I might declare it boldly as I ought to speak." Secret things belong to the Lord our God, but what has been revealed belongs to us and to our children. Well, after 28 years, I finally did it. I had worn through the soul enough times. I retired my college cowboy boots and went to the store this Christmas and bought new ones. I'm embarrassed to tell you how many t t pairs I tried on before I finally walked out the store with these. That poor salesperson Shoot boot after boot, I tried to find the right fit, the right look, but finally, I, 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 I was, I'm taking this pair out. I decided, I put them on. She told me, once you walk out the door, you can't try on anymore. I'm, I'm convinced these are the ones I'm putting on. Done. I say that lightheartedly because our text today tells us to think even more importantly about the things that we're putting on when it comes to the spiritual battle. More, way more important than a pair of cowboy boots that I'll probably wear for another 20 years. The command to put on the armor of God starts with one key word that I want us to think before we get into the, the meat of the text. He says, finally, I wrote a paragraph to tell you what the five chapters preceding this, where we've come from before Paul gets ready to give this command to us that we so desperately need to hear. He says this, finally, you who've been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing, chosen before the foundation of the world to be adopted as God's sons. Finally, remember that you have redemption through Christ's blood. You've been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. You have obtained an inheritance. Don't forget that this isn't how it's always been. You were once dead in the trespasses of your sins, carrying out the desires of the flesh, separated from Christ and without hope 
And without God in this world, by nature, you were children of wrath. Finally, Paul's saying, finally, dear brothers of Ephesus, remember this, that when you were dead in your trespasses, by grace, God saved you. He made you alive with Christ. And so now, brothers and sisters, we get ready to hear these commands, this be strong, put on the armor of God, realize that it comes from five chapters of saying, finally, all these things are true. So before you hear these words, hear all of that first. That is what God says of you. I realize this is a popular text. Chances are your mom probably made you a, sewed you a helmet and gave you a cardboard insert from a, you know, wrapping paper and sent you off to VBS when you were a kid to go put on the armor of God. But I hope just because this is a popular text, we don't get callous to the severity of what Paul's saying the circumstances are. Says, he says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic forces of this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil. There's currently a battle going on by a scheming devil who wants to take you out, is what Paul's saying. But do you notice even in this, all those cosmic powers, rulers, authorities, all those are plural words? We realize we want to have to be, Paul's saying, pay attention. Think about this. There is a battle, and Satan is only one. He's one fallen angel, but he has legions of forces underneath him who are all around carrying out his plans to take you out. And he says, you wrestle against not flesh and blood, but against these evil forces who are personally trying to wipe you out. We have a wrestler in this room, Stone Bennett, Charles Lewis Gilcrease, Joshua Munson. We have high school wrestlers who know what it's like to wrestle man to man. I too wrestled in high school. I know what it's like to have some guy put his hand on your neck, grab your arm, and to feel his weight, his force against you. I know what it's like when you're wrestling to have your face pushed on the mat with this elbow in the back of your head trying to turn you over before you can turn him. Hand-to-hand -hand combat in a wrestling style, which Paul says this is, is intense. It's intimate. It's not just, oh, all is fine. My buddy Gary, when we were in high school, before every dual meet, he would make sure to have garlic and onions the night before for dinner. <laughs> Why? Because wrestling is an intimate endeavor. And that's what Paul says is, is happening against you right now, whether you know it or not. Because of this, Paul tells them to be strong. The nuance, the, it's a present tense verb, so it's like, why keep being strong? But he changes the tense when he tells them to put on the armor of God. The tense goes to an aorist tense, which is a punctilious sort of now, consciously, do this, right now, sort of nuanced verb. Let's think deeply about what you're going to, what we put on. I, I listened to a podcast about the U.S. Space Force. Some of them fly drones to attack our enemies. What armor, do, what, what clothing do they put on? They put on a flight suit, and they, they guide their joystick. It's very different type of armor if you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You put on the pads, the knee pads, you put on the helmet, you put on goggles, because it's a different type of warfare. And so you dress appropriately. <clears throat> well, as we think about this, have you thought about the type of clothing that you've been putting on, the significant type of clothing that you put on? I asked a doctor this week, what was it like to put on that white lab coat, doctor's coat, for the first time? Women, what was it like wearing bridesmaid dress after bridesmaid dress when you finally got to put on that white gown yourself? I wear the, the, the robe and the stole at the 745 service at 11 o'clock. Trust me, when I put on those garments, I think deeply about what I get the privilege of doing every time I do so. Paul's telling us, think deeply about what you're putting on. <clears throat> well, I have good news concerning the spiritual armament that we're told to put on. If you fall into either of these pitfalls, See, sometimes when I'm getting ready to preach these, these awesome things about the armor of God, we can get out and walk out of here all motivated and think, yes, Lord, I'm going to put on the armor of God today. I'm going to put it on tomorrow. And sure enough, 
within a week or two, you're like my Bible study that I asked this week, fellas, when's the last time you thought about the armor of God? You guys giggle because when's the last time you thought about the armor of God? Maybe the last sermon that you preached on it. And so it's like, oh, Lord, I'm so prone to forget. If I'm supposed to put this on consciously today, oh, I forgot yesterday. That's a pitfall. And at the same time, the other side of the road, if there's ditches on either side, the other side is to put too much emphasis on the armor of God and treat it as if it's like a checklist. Of like, am I being a good Christian? Is God going to protect me when I walk out those doors today? Oh, man, I can't forget. And it becomes this, like, checklist of what it makes to be a good Christian. Well, I have good news for you. Here's my overarching thought. When Paul was getting ready to describe this armor of God, he wasn't first and foremost looking at the Roman centurion next to him with a bright, shiny sword or with a nice leather belt all cinched up. He wasn't primarily first and foremost thinking about that centurion and comparing the armor of God. See, Paul was a Hebrew. And so for Paul, he would have think, been thinking about all the words of Scripture that had come hundreds of years before Rome ever took power. And he would think about all the Scripture of where the, the war, the armament of God is on to full display. This morning, we're going to spend a lot of our time in the book of Isaiah. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to quote a lot of my, my sermon came from Dr. Ian Deguid, who wrote a wonderful article on Desiring God. I want, to, I want to quote you what he says. He says this, realizing that the armor described in Ephesians 6 has an Old Testament background, challenges the common view that the Christian armor is primarily a set of disciplines we must form, perform to measure up as Christians. Now, it is certainly true that God's armor describes essential qualities for us to pursue passionately if we were to stand firm under Satan's assault. Yet the armor is first and foremost God's armor rather than ours. The armor is first and foremost God's armor rather than ours. In light of this, I'm going to preach two points today. First point is you have already you are being commanded to put on already used battle armor. It's already been used by somebody else. And secondly, this battle armor has already seen victory. So what do I mean by you you're you're being told to put on used battle armor? Well, it's not like Harry Potter standing in the, in the broom store looking at the Nimbus 2000 and seeing, it. oh, it's so shiny. I wonder if I could purchase it. No, no, no. Each of the pieces in Ephesians chapter 6 have already been talked about in ancient Hebrew scripture where a divine warrior gives his battle-hardened equipment to us. <clears throat> See, you don't want the shiny Roman stuff. You want the stuff that's already been through the battle. The Roman um, breastplate, I'll consider this, let me do Isaiah 59. This chapter written in the 8th century by Isaiah about the ancient foes of Israel, the Babylonians. God's going to fight against the Babylonians on Israel's behalf, and he says this. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in fury as in a mantle. According to the Babylonian deeds, so he will repay wrath to his adversaries. See, it says the Lord himself put on righteousness like a breastplate and the helmet of salvation. God himself wore a breastplate and a helmet way before Paul's looking at the Roman centurion. The Roman breastplate was a, was a piece of metal, sometimes a metal one, two pieces, or sometimes it was chain mail, but it would cover the vital organs, and it would prevent against a knife thrust, it would prevent against a, a longer sword hack, but this armament that they would wear, you know, you could think, oh, that's awesome, but can I wear it? Is it too heavy? Is it going to fit? It can start to feel like one more thing to put on, to do, in the midst of trying to walk with the Lord. Brothers and sisters, here's my encouragement. If you're trying to put on a breastplate that doesn't fit you well, if you're trying to maintain your breastplate, and it's already been some chain mail has been knocked out by a th thrust of the enemy, or it's becoming threadbare and thin metal because you keep not living up to what you know you're supposed to do, my encouragement is this. The breastplate that you need to put on is not the one maintained by you. It's not even yours. The Lord himself puts on a breastplate on our behalf. The God himself 
put on a breastplate of righteousness and a helmet of salvation on Israel's behalf, and he puts it on for you. He's fought for Israel. He will fight for you. In a similar way, when a Roman soldier would tighten his belt and he put that tunic on, it would hold his sword tightly in place. It would hold his clothing up such he could run and he could fight and he could grapple. And it was effective. Now, the reality, when we think about that, it's not just, again, a, a Roman piece of equipment. Isaiah 11 says this. God's going to bring judgment upon Assyria. Then he promises his people Israel, a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. Righteousness shall be a belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. What the New Testament translates the, the belt of truth is has the same sentiment of faithfulness, truth, righteousness. It's already been wrapped around the Lord who fights our behalf. The messianic heir of David, whose core qualities are truth and faithfulness, already wears the belt on our behalf. This is the same true for the shield. The Roman shield was five feet tall, three feet wide, and when a flaming arrow would come, it was made of two laminated boards of, of wood inside before it was wrapped in leather and before it was bound with metal. And then when those arrows would come through, they would lodge deep into that wood and it would, it would embed so deeply that it would snuff out the flames. It was a perfect shield to hide behind when you're going into war. But listen to this, Genesis 15 tells Abraham, Abraham, I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. Proverbs 30, the Lord says, I am a shield to those who take refuge in him. When Paul sees that Roman shield off to the side, it's great. But the reality is, is the Lord's not even just offering his shield. He says, I myself am your shield. And he says, I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. Nothing can get past him. The feet, ready with the gospel of peace, is also illustrated by the Roman sandal. Did you know those Roman sandals had studded nails attached to the sole of those things? Which are perfect for defense. If you're getting pushed back, you can grip. But at the same time, if you need to thrust forward, it's like cleats on the bottom of those sandals. How effective to move and swipe and stab. Well, the reality is Paul's not just looking at him and thinking, ah, oh, the sword is like the sword of those sandals. No, no, no. He has something much greater on his mind. He's a Hebrew first before he lives in this Roman world. Isaiah 52 says this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Feet bringing good news of peace. This is only mentioned in Nahum, Isaiah, and in the Ephesians 6 passage. These things have been resonating in Paul's mind. The Lord is the one who brings the good news. He already reigns. In a similar way, the sword of the Spirit, the word of God is promised by Isaiah. He says this in chapter 49, The Lord made my mouth like a sharp sword to be a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the world. Like that double-edged Roman sword, God's word has already gone forth to be a light to the nations, already permeating, slicing, dicing, and grappling for truth to be embraced. Now, for as I describe all these pieces of armament, I realize, wow, those sound awesome. I want to wear them well. And at the same time, I realize for some, it's just you're, you're too weak to even think about putting them on. Life has been so hard. We so easily fall into sin. We so easily fall short of even the good intentions that we have as far as walking with the Lord. Well, Blaise Pascal, once the 17th century physicist and philosopher, once said this, what is man but the glory and the refuse of the universe? What is man but the glory and the garbage of the universe? What does he mean? He means this. You are given, you are an image bearer of the Lord God Almighty. You can display his love to an onlooking world, forgiving and being kind to people even when they don't deserve it. That is glorious. And at the same time, we so often fail to even love well those ones who live in the same household with us. We so often, we are the garbage of the universe and the same, we've been given so much and we can waste it and squander it Instead of going to prayer, the hours one can spend on social media, 
or flipping on their phone, Netflix or whatever. Well, if you fail to put on the armor of God as God commands, if you feel like some days you're glorious and some days you're garbage, this, there's good news for you. Paul is not looking at how well the Roman soldier's armament fits him that day, how well he's measured up. Instead, he is thinking about the one who's already measured up on your behalf, who already puts on a righteous breastplate, and he gives it to you. It is not threadbare. It is not worn. There's no holes in it. The Lord God Almighty wears the armament on your behalf. So my last point is this. Not only has this battle armor been offered to you by one who's already worn it on your behalf, the good news is the divine warrior who's already worn this armament is Jesus himself, and he has already won the victory in the armament. He is already reigning victorious on our behalf. Jesus, the triumphant warrior, used the truth of God's word to defeat Satan in the desert. Jesus, the one who girded his loins for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its sh shame, and sat down at the right hand of God the Father in power and in glory, already victoriously wears the armor of God on our behalf. That's good news. And whether you put it on well today or not, he's wearing it firmly, consciously, deliberately for you. On September 17th, I went to the ATM to get money out of the bank. I had plenty of money for the $80 that I went to withdraw. I put my card in. The, teller, the ATM said, see the teller. I went into the teller. She does her thing, and then she finally says, huh, and then she reads a paragraph. Chase Bank has terminated their relationship with you. Your funds are, are locked. It will not be, they will be returned to you in six to eight weeks by, by money order. That's all it said. She knew nothing more. There's no, I, I did no illegal banking. There's nothing that I did to prompt this. After 22 years, Chase Bank terminated their relationship with me with no warning after no instigation. My mortgage went through Chase. My car payments went through Chase. I just sent my daughter to Michigan to co go to college. I couldn't send money to my daughter to buy books the first week because Chase terminated their relationship with me. Now, fast forward five months of me calling the fraud department countless times. They have given me back most of my money. However, they still say, oh, another check is coming, and it hasn't. Week after week after week, they still have my money. They also told me, oh, and we're keeping this other payment that was sent to you via Zelle. We're not giving it back to you. The person who sent it me, can't, it's already been processed. They can't have it back. I can't have it back. Chase has told me they're keeping it. It's been five months, and I still don't have my money. Now, is this the reality? Just we live in a, fraud, in a fallen world where fraud is rampant, and so we have to deal with things like that? Or is there a spiritual battle going on that the Lord says there's an adversary who's trying to distract me, trying to take me out, and he knows I need to make my mortgage payment? Well, that's my, I could list off the other things that my wife and I are dealing with. What are you dealing with? It might not just be that oh, this ailment keeps getting worse. And though the doctors are hopeful, it's just one step after one step, it just keeps getting worse. It, it might not be just a, a, a circumstance that someone that you love is hard-hearted towards someone else that you love and can't seem to get things forgiven and get moved back towards one another. See, what is the spiritual battle going on in your life or my life? I don't exactly know if my financial woes are spiritual battle. However, I am told that there is an adversary who's wrestling with all of his minions, and we know the spiritual battle is real. My brothers and sisters, here's the thing. If I get the money back or not, now I want the money back, but if I don't get the money back, I don't actually need the money. The Lord who owes the cattle on a thousand hills has taken care of me even though Chase hasn't given it back yet. And he fights the battle on my behalf. He wears the armament perfectly for me. And he's already secured victory. The battle today, I might stumble, I might fall, but he's already won the war. He's already promised it. So today, as I get ready to pray, if you haven't put on the battle armor in a while, it feels so foreign 
or you put it on and the straps don't fit just right, be encouraged about this. It's not necessarily about how well you and I put it on. Now, don't get me wrong. Put on the armor of God. The battle is real. But know this. There is one who's hundreds of years before those Romans already wearing the battle armament on your behalf. And that's good news. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you are indeed good, and that you are victorious, and that you sent your son victoriously on our behalf to defeat our true enemy, Satan himself, and he stands defeated, even for now, if he gets to wield a little bit of power. We pray that you protect us. We pray that you keep us, our hearts soft towards you. Would you continue to draw us near? And Lord, may we be conscious to put on the armor it is offered to us, and we want to wear it. In Jesus' name, amen.